Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you join us. We would like to remind you as we start our lesson today that the materials that we use here in our lesson are available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And we've got some exciting new things coming up. Stay tuned, we'll tell you all about them in the future. Our lesson for today in this series, Revival and Reformation, is entitled Prayer, the Heartbeat of Revival. It's lesson number two in this series for July 13 of 2013. I hope you have a Bible handy, because it'll be very useful in this lesson. And when you get your Bible in hand, bow your heads with us, and let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we look for, for your guidance with great respect and honor, especially as we study these very core principles in the Christian life. Prayer. Think of all it should and can mean to us. May we come to be more like you through this study is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Whether we believe it or not, God wants to be our friend. He has designated three very clear ways in which we can get to know him better. Bible study, we learn about him. Prayer, we talk to him, we tell him our questions, we tell him our problems, we ask for forgiveness perhaps, and witnessing and sharing. And we'll talk more about that later, but witnessing and sharing is important as well because it's very easy to, to, to think that you understand a subject a lot better than you do until you try to teach it to somebody else. So God says, you need to try that. You need to try sharing what you believe and see how well you really understand it. So those are the key elements in the Christian life. Each of these methodologies has its very specific purpose, as you could guess. This particular lesson, of course, we're focusing on prayer. Alfred Lord Tennyson, the famous author, st said, more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. What does rot mean? Rot means caused, or brought about, or caused to happen. God's faithful people are not yet in his kingdom. Why? Could a better understanding of the role or purpose of prayer bring us closer? Well, in the New Testament, and particularly in the book of Acts, we read a marvelous results from personal and group prayer. In his own prayer life, Jesus revealed a constant dependence on his heavenly Father. Have you ever wondered exactly how Jesus practiced his prayer life? Let's look at a few verses that would give us a clue. Look at Mark 1, verse 35, and I'm going to read from my Good News Bible. Very early the next morning, and considering the context, it was very early. Long before daylight, that'll give you a clue, Jesus got up and left the house. He went out of the town to a lonely place where he prayed. Very, well, a long time before daylight. How, how, how early do you suppose that is? Depends upon the time of year. <laughs> well, it doesn't, it doesn't change that much in Palestine. It's not that far from the equator. So sunrise is going to be around between probably 5.30 and 6.30 or 7. That's, that's the range. So a long while before daylight would be 4, 3.30, somewhere there, I would think. Well, uh, he has said that he's, he spent all night in prayer, so it might have been even earlier than that. Well, we're, we're going to come to that in a moment. Another verse, Luke 5, verse 16 says, but he would go away to lonely places where he prayed. Now, lonely places, where do you suppose that would be? Just away from the people, away from, away from people. The town. Did Jesus get involved in group prayer? Yes. yes. Can you think of an example? When you taught him how to he pray? Thought, oh. Well, look at Luke 9, 18. One day when Jesus was praying alone, the disciples came to him. Who do the crowd say I am, he asked, and, and so forth, the discussion. He was praying alone. Most of the times we read about Jesus' prayer, it was praying alone. Do you think he had a completely different mode or, 
or way of praying than we know anything about? Well, look at these words from Ellen White, the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Christ was continually receiving from the Father that he might communicate to us. The word which ye hear, he said, is not mine, but for the Father's which sent me, John 14, 24. Not for himself, but for others, he lived and thought and prayed. From hours spent with God, he came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to man. Daily he received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. Daily. In the early hours of the new day, the Lord awakened him from his slumbers. Now who's, who's wakening who here? <laughs> and his soul and his lips were anointed with grace that he might impart to others. That's Review and Herald, August 11, 1910. Another place, and this was, is found in uh, volume 4 of the Testimonies, page 528, first paragraph. When the cities were hushed in midnight slumber, when, the, when every man had gone to his own house, Christ, our example, would repair to the Mount of Olives, and there amid the overshadowing trees would spend the entire night in prayer. How much of the night? All night. All night. He who was himself without the taint of sin, a treasure house of blessing, whose voice was heard in the fourth watch of the night by the terrified disciples upon the stormy sea, in heavenly benediction, and whose word could summon the dead from their graves. He it was who made supplication with strong crying and tears. He prayed not for himself. Notice again repeatedly, he prayed not for himself, but for those whom he came to save. As he became a suppliant, what's a suppliant? Requester? Hmm? A requester? A requester, someone who's asking for something, begging for something, asking for something. As he became a suppliant, seeking at the hand of his father fresh supplies of strength, and coming forth refreshed, after doing what? Praying all night. Praying all night long. He came forth how? Refreshed. Refreshed. And invigorated. And invigorated as man's substitute. He identified himself with suffering humanity and gave them an example of the necessity of prayer. How do you pray all night long and come forth refreshed? It's reminiscent of when he was talking with the woman at the well. And when his disciples came back with food, they said, you need something to eat. He says, I got food you don't know anything about. Mm. Yep. It's, it must be similar to what we're seeing here to pray all night and be refreshed. All right, we don't have, I don't have room to put everything that I get a chance to look at when I'm studying these lessons. But I can tell you, there are places where she says, and everything he did, we can do. Perhaps not in the case of Jesus, but we ourselves, we have stress, stresses of this world, work, family, uh, worry, things like that, which we should not do. But when we pray it, it, it relieves all of that and we can become refreshed too. Mm -hmm. That's true. Well, let's take another example. Here's a, a, a comment about the very early history of the Adventist Church. It's found in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 206. Elder Hiram Edson and others who were keen, noble, and true were among those who, after the passing of the time in 1844, <clears throat> search for the truth as for hidden treasure. What are they doing? The Bible. Searching the Bible for the truth. I met with them and we studied and prayed earnestly. Often we remained together until late at night and sometimes through the entire night praying for light and studying the Word. Again and again these brethren came together to study the Bible in order that they might know its meaning and be prepared to meet to teach it with power and a number of other places. Why, why did it take so much effort? Why did they have to pray and pray and pray and pray? Why didn't why couldn't, study they just, study? why couldn't they just pray and be given the answer? I suspect that they wanted to be sure. 
they wanted to study because you have to compare and we'll talk about this next week when we when we talk about Bible study you need to compare scripture with scripture and the Bible says you need to read it all because it's surprising what you can find in places that you absolutely don't expect I can tell you just something completely unrelated to this but it was a real insight to me I was recently reading in a book addressed to a particular institution uh, that some of us are very familiar with, uh, written by Ellen White. And in there she talked a little bit about, uh, you know, what was going on. And, and, and she happened to be talking a little bit about Christ. And she's talking about his coming, his first coming. And she says, the angel from heaven came down and expected to find many people just eagerly awaiting his first coming. And he looked around and he couldn't find anybody. And he was about ready to go back to heaven when he discovered out in the field there were some shepherds looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. And he says, there's our group. Guys, sing for those guys. <laughs> <laughs> and those are not quite her words, but that was the idea. That, that's unbelievable. Who's ever heard that story before? Everyone else was too busy. Everybody else, and they thought they had it all sewed up. They knew everything. They didn't need anyone to come in to, let them, to tell them anything. The, the modern word for that is taken up with the cares of this life. Yeah. Well, reading on. Christ, the majesty of heaven, laid aside his robes of royalty and came to this world, all seared and marred by the curse, to teach men how to live a life of self-denial and self-sacrifice and how to carry out practical religion in their daily lives. He came to give a correct example of a gospel minister. He labored constantly for one object, all his powers were employed for the salvation of men, and every act of his life tended to that end. After teaching throughout the entire day, he frequently devoted the night to prayer. He made his supplications to his father with strong crying and tears. He prayed not for himself, but for those whom he came to redeem. That's also volume four of the testimonies, page 373, paragraph one. Well... <laughs> if that is defines what his work was, and he says, take up my yoke, mm -hmm. does that bring us into this mode? Should. Well, a careful reading of the gospel suggests that Jesus and his Father, with the cooperation of the Holy Spirit, planned every day of his life. What would happen if Seventh-day Adventists, even a relatively small group of us, did the same? Could we have that kind of relationship with the Father? What would happen if we said, okay, even as a group like our small group here, we said, okay, I'm going to get up early in the morning, and I'm going to kneel down if necessary. I'm going to open my Bible and say, God, let's plan my day. Unfortunately, looked at superficially, the life of Jesus yielded a relatively small result. How many people were committed to his cause on Crucifixion Friday? But fortunately, that was not the end of the story. And of course, you know of places like Acts 2.41, which says many of them believed his message. This is on Pentecost. He believed Peter's message and were baptized. And about 3,000 people were added to the group that day, 3,000 people added that day. And look at chapter 4, verse 4. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. That's just men, not counting women and children, okay? Just men, 5,000. And then look at chapter 6, verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. What were these people doing when Jesus was still here? <coughs> or were these, were these people who really believed that Jesus was right and they just sort of kept quiet because it wasn't a popular thing to think? Where did these priests come from? And I, if we had time, I would show you from the book of Acts that showed that a number of Pharisees became Christians. I thought Nicodemus would be counted among that, yeah. that group. Yeah. Yeah. But just as the disciples had a tremendous change in their attitude yeah. and convictions, I suspect that some of the priests did. Yes. 
And what made the change? Their knowledge that Jesus was the Messiah, that he had risen from the grave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they had that information uh, on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Well, Sunday. But it wasn't well, or, give them or, or, or Sunday, when it was, Sunday <laughs> evening, early in the early in the. But it was uh, it wasn't credit. until Pentecost yeah. that they had that. That was forty days later. Yeah. And what they went on, what went on with them during that time, prepared them for the day of Pentecost. Okay. Your point is an excellent one, but your numbers are slightly off. Okay. Forty okay. days. <laughs> Forty days later, they came back together. It was yeah. fifty days later. Okay. Fifty days, at, and it was ten days after that that the actual Pentecost experience happened. And it was during those ten days when they came back together in Jerusalem that they came together. The, the scripture says they came together with one accord. And Ellen White goes on to say they confessed their sins. You know, these are the people who six weeks before, in the upper room, as Jesus is getting ready to kneel down and, and wash their dirty feet, are arguing about which one's going to be greatest in the kingdom. But don't you think that, that in the time prior to them coming together, as they were yeah. pondering what had happened to them, and they were praying and interacting with each other, that there was changes in their lives oh, yeah. that prepared them for that time. They realized that this was a new story. And we yeah. have that opportunity. Well, reliable estimates suggest that by the end of the first century A.D., there are more than one million Christians in the Roman Empire. Would you call that exponential growth or what? God had a lot to do with that, obviously. But what did God need to make it happen? He depended upon human beings willing to do whatever was necessary to carry the gospel forward. And how many of the disciples ended up being martyrs? No. All but one. Ten. All but one, as far as we know. And that one, of course, was they tried to martyr him, yeah. boil him in the oil, but yep. God had other plans. Well, there are many verses. Let me look at two or three that suggest that prayer was an essential part of that. Look at Acts 1, verse 4. And when they came together, he gave them this order, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift I told you about, the gift my father promised. So that was one. And then look down at verse 7, I mean verse 8, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be filled with power and you'll be witness for, witnesses for me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world, earth. And going on in some other verses, look at verse 14, what they were doing. They gathered frequently to pray as a group together with the women and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They gathered frequently to pray. Have you ever tried to imagine yourself in that group? What do you suppose it was like? I, I believe because they, they saw Jesus after the resurrection, mm -hmm. they were talking directly to the Son and the Father, the Holy Spirit. They were just speaking, talking as if he were there. Well, and they were used to having him there. How different would it, our prayers be if we thought, okay, this person we're praying to is the one that used to be right here? Still is, by the way, just we can't see him. Well, look at a couple of other more verses. Acts, Acts 2.42, they spent their time in learning from the apostles, taking part in the fellowship and sharing in the fellowship meals and the prayers. So, Learning, fellowshipping, sharing, including eating, meals, and prayers. Okay? There are other places. Maybe, let me just pick a couple more. Chapter 6, verses 3, or four, three and 4. So then, brothers and sisters, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will put them in charge of this matter. We ourselves, then, will give our full time to prayer and the work of preaching, the full, our full time. Um, is that supposed to be the model for a pastor in the 21st century? Have we ever? When would the directions, when were the directions changed? <laughs> 
Well, what would happen if a pastor dared to do that? Maybe the church would have to take care of itself and it might grow. <laughs> that would, it would, for a pastor to do that, if he did that, I would think that he would have marvelous things to mm -hmm. say when he did speak. That's right. And presumably the, the church members would uh, be inspired and maybe they would say, hey, something's going on here. Let's be a part of it. That's right. It has been suggested frequently that God speaks to us. This is... I'm, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, Ken. Okay. So it seems like when Jesus was here, there was uh, the two sisters, mm -hmm. Mary Magdalene and, and Martha. Mm -hmm. And one was busy working and one was busy listening. Mm -hmm. Both good, good things to do, mm -hmm. but the important thing was more of the listening and the the prayer and that sounds like that. Mm -hmm. So we need more of that. Yeah. Sorry to have interrupted you. No, it's it, just, all right. it just struck me. So we need to spend more thoughtful time. Yeah. Well, and, and, and let's think about this for a minute. Jesus asks us to follow his example. Now, how far can we do that? I mean, I'm a physician. I'm a full-time practicing physician. So do I drop my work and spend my time praying and studying the Bible? Teach. Teach? I suspect <clears throat> that if you had the mindset that he had, the sense of values that he had, you could do what he would do were he, were he there. Mm -hmm. Because we're promised that he can have the power. So you could continue being a physician mm -hmm and have the mind of Jesus in that profession. Was Jesus a physician? Sure. Man, if I could do what he did, <laughs> they'd be beating down the walls. That's right. I mean, I'm bad enough already. <laughs> well, we have, been, we have suggested many times that we listen to God through Bible study and he, we speak to him through prayer. So it's, it's, it's supposed to be a kind of two-way conversation. It doesn't, that, that's sort of not what we normally think of as a two-way conversation, but we can, we can imagine it at least. Ellen White comments like this, the ultimate revival, the ultimate revival, that's what we're talking about. And revival, by the way, what does revival mean? Literally, coming back to life. Yeah. Revival means coming back to life. That suggests, where are you? Dead. <laughs> You're dead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, very literally, that's what it means. So the ultimate revival in the form of the latter rain is what we are looking for. And then Ellen White says these words, a revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 121. So why don't we pray more? I mean, all of you spend your night sleeping. You could spend the night praying, couldn't you? What if, every, I'm not making what if everybody <laughs> just spent an hour? Yeah, what about that? As opposed to three minutes. Mm -hmm. My mother used to take, every, once a week she would fast and, and pray from morning until noon. And she wanted all of us to do it. We didn't do it. We <laughs> tried and we stopped flying away after a while. But she was able to do it. Uh -huh. Wonderful. Well, are we too busy? Have we, have, we lost, have we lost the science of prayer? Don't we, do we not know how to do it? Is there a specific way to pray? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just saying Jesus was able to go out and pray all night and apparently had wonderful conversations with the Father and came forth refreshed. Now, I, you know, I haven't been able to do that yet. I don't know about you. Tell us your experiences <laughs> if, you, if you got this figured out. Are we claiming that our lives are busier than Jesus' life was? I hope no one's claiming that. I not claim it, but we act like it. <laughs> we, we act like it, okay. Uh, how was it that Jesus managed to pray all night and come forth refreshed? Was that miraculous? I suspect Enoch probably had that kind of relationship. Okay. That, so, yeah. that he, when he was that close to what Jesus was like, mm -hmm. 
Well, they just kind of took a detour and went to his home. Yeah. Well, of course, the big question is, could this happen to us? Perhaps it's a lot like exercise. You know, when we first start and we do a little bit, we're tired, we're sore. But the more we do, it seems to be easier and, yep. and we push ourselves further. And then what used to make us sore and tired is, is nothing. That's, now that's the warm up. Yeah. So exactly. perhaps, perhaps the more we pray, the more we think about God, mm -hmm. the more we hang out with others who think about God and talk with God, we can build up our spiritual muscles within our brain. So let's, let's think about this from one light of your explanation. Do our prayers need to be longer or just better? <laughs> we don't need just longer. Mm -hmm. Quality. Because we know, I, and I can tell you this, and without, I mean, without trying to put anybody down, but I used to live when I was a, small, a young child in, in grade school in a place where there were a couple of radio stations that just had prayers being repeated and some repetitious kind of prayers just going 24-7. And is that, well, of course, none of us would say that's the way to go. Um, do, is the problem that we don't have the right kind of relationship with Jesus Christ? I suspect that if we had the right relationship with him, he would be involved in everything we do. Mm -hmm. I don't care what the profession is, whether it's a plumber or a physician or a lawyer, he can have the mind of Christ with him all the time while he accomplishes that. Yeah. There's, one, there's one reference, and I don't remember where it is right now, but it's as though you looked at the sun and you come away with a sunspot and you can't get rid of that sunspot. It's there wherever you look. She says, that's the way Jesus, we should see Jesus Christ, just like that sunspot, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. everywhere you look and in everything you do. But let me ask you this question. If we, did, we started having that kind of a Christian experience, would we have more temptations? Hmm. Well, the devil's got to have his turn. Probably the same number of temptations, but we'd give in to fewer of them. Maybe. <laughs> we'd notice, so we'd notice them more? I don't know. The closer you there. get, why, the worse you're going to look, so you probably be more interested in getting closer to Christ yet. <laughs> well, but on the other hand, the devil knows that if there are a group of people come up, come, you show up at the same time with that kind of an experience, what happens to him? He's going to be after him. Oh, he, he's in trouble. He's in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, he's in big time trouble. Well, Look at another example. Look at John 17, starting with verse 20. This is a part, what, what, what do we find in John 17? Well, the Jesus most, prays. The, hmm? the last night, that's uh, in between somewhere between, between Supper and Gethsemane. Yeah, and somewhere during that time, Jesus prays this prayer. He prays for himself, he prays for his immediate disciples, and then we come down to verse 20, and look what it says here. I pray not only for them, that would be his immediate disciples, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. How many of us does that include? All. That's all. all of us. All who have read the Bible. I pray they may all be one. Father, may they be in us, just as you are in me and I am in you. They may be in us. Just Could we have a relationship with God that's as close as the Father's relationship to the Son? That's his desire. May they be one so that the world will believe that you sent me. I gave them the same glory you gave me so that they may be one just as you and I are one. I and them and you and me so that they may be completely one in order that the world may know that you sent me and that you love them as you love me. Father, you have given them to me and I want them to be with me where I am. I want them to be with me where I am so that they may see my glory, the glory you gave me, for you loved me before the world was made. Maybe Laodicea would be surprised at that, but I don't think the real Christians would be. Yeah. Well, Jesus prayed for his closest followers. Luke 22, look at this place. Simon, Simon, and who, who's Simon? Who's he talking about? Peter. One Simon Peter. Listen, Satan has received permission to test all of you 
to separate the good from the bad as a farmer separates the wheat from the chaff. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. And when you turn back to me, you must strengthen your brothers. Okay? So, remember, we read earlier that Christ's prayers were primarily for who? For other people, right? But then there was a time when he prayed fervently for himself. And you all know about that time. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter the two son and the two sons of Zebedee. Grief and anguish came over him. And he said to them, the sorrow in my heart is so great that it almost crushes me. Stay here and keep watching me, with me. He went a, little farther on, threw, went a little farther on and threw himself face downwards on the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, take this cup of suffering from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Would we dare to pray a prayer like that? Well, there's another time when he had a very interesting prayer. Matthew 17, Mark 9, what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. What's this transfiguration mean? Where he appeared in shining light, glorified okay. to, the, to the three disciples who were there with him. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and the brothers James and John and led them up a high mountain where they were alone. As they looked on, a change came over Jesus. His face was shining like the sun and his clothes were dazzling white. Okay. Do you think that kind of thing happened to him ever when he was alone, or was this just for the benefit of the disciples? Well, it was primarily for the benefit of the disciples. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere, she's, she talks about Jesus uh, praying, and he asked them to pray along with them, and the mm -hmm. hours uh, passed by, mm -hmm. and he finally went into a mode of praying for his disciples, and pleading with God to give them a view of what he had when he was in heaven and how he could see that. And she says his prayer was answered. Mm -hmm. And it was then that, uh, that the transfiguration took place so that they would have something to hang on to when their big temptation came. Many of Jesus' prayers were directly connected or followed in some cases by miracles. Would we pray more earnestly if some of our prayers were followed by miracles? Maybe that would... Don't look at me like that. <laughs> no, I think so. I think so. We would have to recognize them as miracles. And, uh -huh. uh, the other day I was listening and I, I heard somebody talking about their prayer life. Mm -hmm. And they talked about their prayer journal. Mm -hmm. In which they talked about, they wrote down the things that they prayed for, and then the and results, then the results uh, as they happened later on. And I thought at the time, my, that would be quite a a mechanism to keep prayer before your mind and mm -hmm. and the results and have it strengthened in your own life. How do you understand these words found in Matthew eighteen, nineteen, and twenty? What are these words supposed to mean to us? And I tell you more, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, whenever two of you on earth agree about anything you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, I am there with them. Does that mean that um, you, praying by yourself is a good idea, but praying as a group is even better? Yes. Well, uh, why would that be? I'd reverse that. Yeah. Uh -huh. I would reverse that. I'd say that praying with a group has its place and its, and its purpose, but it's only in, in private prayer with God and you and your relationship that makes, makes you a fit person to be in the public prayer. Yeah. Well, what do you think, well, Ken? I, the way I heard what you said, of course it's, it's wonderful to pray in private and, and have a direct relationship with God, but it seems that there are several places where the scripture that you read is reiterated and it says, you know, I may have my weaknesses, we all may have our weaknesses, but we all have some type of spiritual strength as well. So if we come together in a group, group of friends, and uh, pray to the Lord, the Lord looks at each of us, 
you know, I don't know how to express it, but if we have children, each child has something special, makes you smile in a special way. This one does their funny thing, that one does their thing, mm -hmm. this one's really good at something, and you're, you really like each of them individually. And when they come together and they're shining together and they're calling out to you and it's like a family outing, it's a very joyous thing. I think that when we get together and we pray together as children of God, God hears us like a family. And that's why he says, get together and wherever two or more are gathered together, I will be there with them. I wouldn't want to detract from that in the least. Yeah. Of course, he's with us as well when we pray solely, but, but he does say, come together in prayer. Well, Ellen White said these words, the promise is made on condition that the united prayers of God's people are offered and answer these prayers, there may be expected a power greater than that which comes in answer to private prayer. The power given would be proportionate to the unity of the members and their love for God and for one another. Is that the problem? <laughs> That's the word. <laughs> the fact that people, we can actually agree on something and really unite with one cause and one uh, main focus. I think that's the, what makes it so powerful. Is, is it possible that, um, is it possible that uh, some people can't pray for themselves and therefore can't there's pray a... Pray by themselves or for themselves or with themselves or... Pray I'm going to use the word for themselves, yeah. and therefore that's in part a necessity for intercessory prayer. Now that mm. sounds like a funny thing, but I guess what I'm thinking about is possibly a situation like demon possession, mm -hmm. where, yeah, uh, and, and I know that, and maybe we're kind of opening up something here about prayer that I mean, I, I, I don't know what it would be, but I, I, I can see how somebody might have a yearning and God could understand that yearning, but somehow there's, it seems like there's, there's a mechanism to prayer that seems to be almost essential. And I'm, mm -hmm. what, what else would be the purpose of an intercessory prayer? Yeah. Intercessory means you're praying for someone else. Yeah. Uh, and of course, certainly Jesus prayed for us, or for the disciples, and I guess they could and pray for, for us. Yes, and I guess they could pray for themselves, but is there, I don't know, is there something to what I'm, these thoughts that are rumbling through my mind that I don't have any, any facts or, or well, footnotes for or we, scripture? We all, we all recognize that <clears throat> God knows everything about us and <clears throat> for us, etc., before we even pray. So, do we really recognize that when we pray? Do we, do we every time we, we open our mouths or, or even direct our attention to God in prayer, do we say, God, I know you already know all about this, but let's talk about it. Would that make a difference if we just really honestly said that and recognize that? But that I think we should. That, that seems to be a... a a realistic s circumstance, a situation. So therefore, it seems to open up some kind of a purpose for mm -hmm. prayer that we don't normally, I mean, why would we need to pray? Yeah. What, what is, uh, we often say there's a relationship thing here. What, you, what, what, you know, what, yeah. why do I need to do that if God already knows that? What, why, what is the purpose for this exercise? Well, and the example I would, I would choose is one that, I mean, this wasn't, the, I wasn't the first one who thought this up by any means, but if you were dating someone, let's say even you're engaged to them and you're, pl you're planning a marriage soon and so forth, you say, well, I, I don't really need to talk to that person today. I guess I'm, I won't know anything I didn't know yesterday, so I, I'll just skip it today. The other thing, <laughs> I like that. Oh, good. <laughs> Once a week works fine. <laughs> One hour, two hours. I told you I love you. Don't you believe it? I, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. That was a good analogy. But I, I think <laughs> you combine that with the notion of the prayer isn't to work any change in God. Mm -hmm. The object of prayer is to work a change in us. And unless we are involved in. Oh, 
anything, any project we get into, we have to think about it, we have to discuss it, even if we're discussing it in our own mind. Mm -hmm. But we come to knowledge, we come to uh, a greater mm -hmm. appreciation of our desire for a particular thing if we get involved in it that way. Otherwise, if it's just a, a routine, Lord, I want you to do this, I want you to do that, I want you to do the other thing, I think we're kidding ourselves. John Bunyan, the one who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, famous <coughs> author, said, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. There you go. <laughs> and I'm sorry, there can you, you repeat that, please? Can. You can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you have prayed. <laughs> okay. Without me, you can do nothing. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, let's take a specific example. Do you remember the story in Acts 12? About this time, King Herod began to persecute some members of the church. He had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he went on to arrest Peter. And I don't have time to talk about the whole story, but you remember Peter was put in this very, very exclusive prison with 16 guards through multiple gates keeping him. And he was scheduled to be, to be, I don't know, crucified or, or beheaded the following morning. And Peter's sleeping. And what is the church doing? Praying. Praying. And what happened? Well, the government plans got interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> government plans got interrupted. Well, so would we conclude that Peter would still be in the prison if, the, if they haven't prayed? Well, look at what, and I would ask you a different question. I would ask you, if you were in the building, let's, uh, we're pretty sure it was the upper room. In fact, it says so, basically. If you had been in the upper room, what would you have prayed for? How would you have prayed? Lord, release Peter from prison. If it's okay. your will. Now, the next question is, if you were Peter, would you have been sleeping or would you have been praying? <laughs> well, I suppose he had to sleep at some point and he had prayed. Well, if you're going to be beheaded the next time. morning, you might not think you need to spend any time sleeping. You know, in, in response to my own well, you might as well. <laughs> answer to my own question there about that, I, um, so they're praying for, for Peter to be released. Yeah. I don't think they're praying for what happened. I think they're probably praying that, that, that the authorities will come to their senses or something. Mm -hmm. I don't think they were praying <laughs> for what happened. Well, they, and, they and, had a hard time when Peter showed up, didn't they? Yeah, and, <laughs> and therefore, very likely, the, there, was a reason God, there was a reason God responded like he did, to fortify their, their faith, to yeah. fortify their courage. Um, remember the, the girl came, the, 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 the servant girl came to the door and she recognized Peter's voice and she went back and says, Peter's at the door and what did they say? No, nah, it couldn't be, it must be his angel. If they had said that to me, I would say, let's go have a look, I want to see this angel. <laughs> but it was really Peter and Peter talked to them briefly and said, I think it's time for me to get out of here. And he departed. Yeah. Um, Sometimes Christians feel like their prayers never go higher than the ceiling. Have you ever had that experience? Sometimes they think they're just talking to themselves. Well, seriously, now if God already knows everything we need and why we need it, do we need to ask for anything? Or should we just talk to him? Back to his, his question. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Did, does a person who th would think that, that my prayer is never going to, is that, is that a person who, has, who hasn't experienced enough prayer? Very possibly. I would think that a person who has experienced enough prayer would know that uh, God answers prayer. It may oh. not be right now, and it may not be exactly like you think you've, you've, you've what you've prayed for, but my my, that's a strong way to say it, but my experience, or at least the faith that I have is that 
based upon what I believe or my own experiences, that God answers prayer. And, and if it doesn't seem like it's getting answered now, it's going to get answered. And probably in a way, very much like Peter's experience, something even a whole lot better than what you're praying for isn't really enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, and my response to people who say, well, I don't think my prayers are going on beyond the ceiling, I would say, well, who's in the room with you? <laughs> I mean, they don't have to go beyond the ceiling. You know, sometimes people get the idea, well, I have to somehow rather I get in my prayers all the way to, I don't know, outer Mongolia, not, <laughs> I shouldn't say outer Mongolia, <laughs> to the other side of the universe, to, to, to God's place somewhere. No, he's right there. It, the prayers don't have to go far away. They don't even have to be verbalized at all. Well, <clears throat> what does it mean to pray in the name of Jesus? It's, it's not really our prayer, it's, it's Jesus' prayer. So Jesus is saying it to the Father. In other words, our, we're, putting, we're putting his stamp, his seal on it, not us. Don't look at my, whether I was good or bad. It's about Jesus. Jesus is the one. He died for us. He sacrificed for us. So I, I'm asking for this, but I'm not asking using my authority. I'm using my best friend, my savior, my, my lawyer, if you will, Jesus. If, if you prayed a wonderful prayer and God says, that's exciting and the angels are just getting ready to come and answer it, and you fail to say in Jesus' name, would God have to say, cancel out that prayer? No? I don't think so. So what does it mean to pray in the name of Jesus? Does, maybe we don't need to. Well, I think... I, I, I'm I, posing some questions here, folks. I'm <laughs> I, I think, uh, I think in, a, in a way, there's an authority that comes with that. Okay. You're authorized. You are... You know, you can be sent as, a, as an emissary. You can be sent as, a, as an emissary from the President of the United States or the King, and, and um, it's in, in his name that I, am, I have been sent here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, think, I think there's something similar in a way with, with this. I can't define it all that much, but... I think there is something there, and not just because you throw it around, why that's, you're going to get what you want, but I, I think there is an authority, and I think, I wouldn't be surprised if, if the devil knows there's an authority there, too. <laughs> okay. Jesus was totally dedicated to the business that got, he and his father were about, and I think when it says to pray in the name of Jesus, our prayers have to be directed by that mindset. Mm -hmm. when we are praying for the things that Jesus would pray for if he yeah. were in our spot. That's praying in the name of Jesus. Yeah. But, but so often our prayers are, Lord, give me this, do that, yeah. I need this, and we, they're totally self-centered, whereas his prayers were other-centered more frequently. How do you know what that is unless you've spent some time learning from what he had to teach? Yeah. I mean, if, uh, if, nice. it's just not a formula, well, I got that thing, it's like a magic key, now, and, and expect uh, something to happen. No, you want to be in harmony with, with what he t came to teach. That's yeah. right. I, I heard a, a statement the other day, uh, and the gist of it is, when Jesus was in heaven, he inspired the Old Testament writers so he'd have something to study. I, I, it, 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 <laughs> <laughs> a good idea. It, 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 it just made so much sense to me. So yeah. it's, uh, well, I think it's pretty clear from if you read the whole context of scripture that when we pray in the name of Jesus what God is really saying is think about what I would pray for if I were in your situation yeah. it's not you know I it amuses me when you go on Amazon on the internet and you say all these things worth thousands of dollars says put it on your wish list <laughs> prayer is not a wish list that's not the way it works. it works. Prayer is an opportunity for us to say, okay, God, I understand you as far as I'm capable, and I want to think and pray the way you want me to think and pray. And that would be transformational. Yeah. 
at the same time, God always recognizes our freedom. In the setting of the great controversy, God limits his actions based on our freedom and the constant opposition of the devil. Let's talk about that. Certainly, we would all recognize that God has the power to do anything he decides to do. He could eliminate the devil. He has that power. Gone. You know, he could do that. He could heal every sick or hurting Christian. He could perform miracles in response to every Christian's prayer. But that would distort the issues in the great controversy. We wouldn't be able to see the evil results of sin, even the evil results of impacting people who weren't the sinners. I mean, it's not my fault if I'm driving down the freeway and someone drunk comes charging across from the other side and, and wipes me out. That's not my fault. But it helps us to recognize the evil consequences of sin. How often do we limit what God can do for us because of our own sinful desires and selfishness? Most of the time. If we pray for something as an individual, or even as a group, does that give God permission to do things in the setting of the great controversy which he could not do otherwise? Absolutely, yeah. because when, even when uh, the disciples asked Jesus how they should pray, if we f go and look at the Lord's Prayer bit by bit by bit, he tells them, pray, you need to pray so what happens, you know, God's will as it is done in heaven will be done here. So that, uh, that kind of implies that we do something to make changes happen here, mm -hmm. and we have to keep doing that do thing. In the great controversy, God could say to the devil, stand back, here's a group of people praying, and they're asking me to step in and do something. I can do that because they're asking me to. But does he have some kind of formula that says, for this kind of thing, I need 399 prayers, and for this one, I need 700? And how do you keep that from being a mechanical yeah. notion? And we have to be careful of that, but I think I, I'm absolutely convinced that God, when we pray for things, God has a permission, it has the right. And, and, and ultimately, the criteria is there, is he has to look like he's being fair in the minds and, and the vision of the onlooking universe. But when you've got, Whatever that takes. When you've got a group of people praying in the, in the proper attitude, there will be changes in those people. When there's a change in the person, mm -hmm. God can do something that he couldn't do before. But there are times when God does things even when you can't do anything. You may be changed, but you may not have any way. I mean, some, you're praying for something on the other side of the world, and it might happen. You know, can you use the, the marital relationship uh, and the courting relationship mm -hmm. a little while ago? about talking about preparation for the wedding and so forth. And when you are in the courting relationship, you're communicating quite a little bit. But after you're married a while, in some cases, uh, and I think many cases, um, you don't have to communicate it as much because you think alike. Um, and that doesn't... Maybe, cause that, maybe that's because you've been communicating a lot. Well, <laughs> that, that could be true. So, <laughs> so um, uh, when we think of prayer, we think of almost a formalized thing. Yeah. Is, is, it, is, it, is it really that way? Or if, if one found oneself not uh, f formalized in their prayer so much, but more in a conversation throughout the day, yeah. well, is, is that prayer too? Yes, yes. absolutely. I think it is. Um, I think it we're is. sort of running out of time here, but God talks in 2 Corinthians 10 about powerful weapons that he will give us to fight the fight of faith. What do you suppose those weapons will be like? Well, Ellen White adds these words, surely prayer is a weapon that none of us can afford to do without. We too must have times set apart for meditation and prayer and for receiving spiritual refreshing. We do not value the power and efficacy of prayer as we should. Prayer and faith will do what no power on earth can accomplish. Ministry of Healing, page 509. The battleground of the great controversy is in the minds of God's children. Do you sometimes feel like you're in a battleground, or maybe that you are a battleground? Well, but what's the best way to pray? Do we need to kneel down? Do we need to have our Bibles open in front of us? 
Both of those are good ideas. Jesus offered prayer while standing up at the grave of Lazarus, while sitting down the Mount of Olives, I mean, and the, the, the way he gave the Sermon on the Mount, and apparently he was lying flat on the ground in the Garden of Gethsemane. What does that tell us? We can pray to God under any circum, in any kind of stance. Is there a standard pattern that God suggests he, rec he recommends for prayer? Well, on two different occasions, God gave the Lord's Prayer, and that, that's a good example to look at in Matthew 6, 7 to 13, and Luke uh, 11, 2 to 4. It is often very meaningful to pray to God as one is studying the Scriptures. You may want to praise His name after reading a particularly meaningful passage. Daniel is an excellent example. If you have a chance, look at Daniel chapter 9. Start Read from verse 8 to 19. And Daniel says, we are a bunch of sinners. And I don't think Daniel was that bad a sinner. He looks like a pretty good saint to me. But he says, we have done terrible things, Lord. We, we deserve what you gave us. But now, for your name's sake, let us go back to Jerusalem. Because your name is being dragged in the dirt because of your people. So, Lord, for your name's sake, your holy hill, your holy city, take us back to Jerusalem. And how many of us pray for God's reputation? Well, there are some things we need to do in prayer. We need to give thanks. Uh, a general outline for prayer might be beginning with praise and adoration. Number two, confessing our faults. Uh, thanking God for his wonderful forgiveness. Number four, tell God what you believe you or others might need. And five, recognizing that God knows best, we submit all our requests as an added, in an attitude of humility and trust. And Ellen White put in, puts it in these words, keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, and your fears before God. You cannot burden him. You cannot weary him. He who numbers the hairs of your head is not indifferent to the wants of his children. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. The relations between God and each soul, each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. Wow. I mean, what can you say after those words? That's Steps to Christ, page 100. Do we recognize the importance of prayer in our lives? Do we recognize the necessity of prayer for uh, the revival that's ahead? Do you think the time will come when we might have Pentecostal kind of experiences again? Absolutely, and more so. Um, we need to have a deeper sense of our need for prayer. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion of prayer. Have one of your own. See you later.